Hey everybody, thanks for coming out. Uh, this is the Penn State Technology Club and tonight we have Gail De La Cruz and she will be talking about uh, purple thinking hacker ethos in a sock setting. Um, and I will pass it over to you. Okay, thank you very much, Ray. Uh, before I start, I'd like to do an acknowledgement of country. Uh, so it's just a brief statement. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today at you know, you're over there and I'm over here. And I'd like to pay my respects to elders past and present. So, okay, so let's start with this. By, uh, if you have like any questions, feel free to just like, you know, pop like a message or something or just like, you know, ask a question, but there will be time after the presentation to, you know, ask the questions, okay? Okay, so who am I? So I'm based in Melbourne. I live in Melbourne, not in Florida, but in Australia. I work as a cyber threat analyst for Cyber Research New Zealand. So the office is based in New Zealand. They're two hours ahead of uh, Melbourne. I, uh, it's currently 10.06 a.m. here Thursday. So I'm, you know, greetings from the future. <laughs> okay. So I call, uh, someone called me a B-Sides groupie because I basically go uh, to the different B-Sides uh, conferences around Australia before, you know, the pandemic. And then I used to, um, I, I used to joke that I, I live out of a suitcase because I was frequently traveling for work, but now I'm like really happy that I'm, you know, a home-based remote worker. And I'm part of last year's first batch of the Project Friedman uh, group. So it's an initiative by the AWSN, the Australian Women in Security Network and Women Speak Cyber to encourage and support women in their careers and to, you know, give talks to uh, different groups of people or in conferences. And I'm a firm believer in IDIC principle, infinite diversity, and infinite combination. So I uh, submit to a lot of uh, conference call for a presentation because I'd like to make sure that the industry is open and welcoming of, you know, different uh, people, people of color, different, you know, uh, different background. Okay. So, okay, so, okay. Yeah. Now, so, yeah, yeah, Vulcan model. <laughs> okay, edict principle, cool. Okay, so I'm basically going to be talking about what's a SOC, evolution of the SOC, and then what's the skill set uh, required if you were interested in working in a SOC. And then basically, I, you know, talking from a perspective of somebody who's a purely blue team, then move into like this, this kind of environment wherein my teammates are, majority of them are pen tester, and they have really influenced my, you know, my thinking once I started working with them. And then I'm going to talk about the hacker in. Okay, now pop quiz. I have here two photos, one on the left, one on the right. Now, who could guess uh, which one is uh, representative of a SOC, a Security Operation Center? Okay, like you know, pop your answer. Uh, don't worry, this is not a graded quiz. <laughs> this is like the right uh, one. Uh, Okay, the one that says on the <laughs> sock on the wall. Yes, that's a uh, key giveaway. Okay, why did I uh, include it here? Okay, because I'm going to be talking about like the evolution of um, the sock. So basically, uh, in my, in my, uh, this is, I'm talking from experience where in, during the early part of the century, okay, I'm, uh, uh, I'm several moon seasons old. Okay, so I basically shifted uh, career. So I started, uh, my big break in the tech field was working as a technical support engineer for Cisco. So it's it's like a knock where it, uh, we resolve issues regarding, you know, Cisco infrastructure. So I started first with do, uh, dealing with network management systems and then move into one wide area network uh, and I used to like troubleshoot uh, ISDN, you know, DSL, those frame relay, those kind of one connection. So it's more on the knock. And then what I observed was that at the time when we talk about security, uh, that was early 2000, people would think of network security in terms of, you know, firewalls, all those things. And then gradually through the years, uh, that particular security function was moved to like a different team and they started calling it like a SOC, Security Operations Center. Now, okay, so let me just differentiate. So 
uh, when we talk about NOC, okay, so it's uh, this is the group that deals with network infrastructure. So these are will be your routers, switches, you know, VoIP gateways, and then uh, systems like servers, application. They also like group it together in a NOC. And then, as I mentioned, like uh, the network security part, like firewalls, VPN gateways, these are under like the NOC umbrella or the group. And then you have the SOC wherein they realize that, oh, there has to be specialized group of people who will look into like the logs, events, you know, those security uh, related uh, information, so sec uh, security event monitoring. And then there's also vulnerability management, like, you know, uh, discovering the asset. What do you have there? And then, and what uh, what do you have there? And at the same time, like, uh, are there like, you know, certain vulnerabilities like CVEs, issues and all those things. So on the left, it's like a column for think of it like knock. And then on the right, you have the SOC. But there are like some organizations. So in my previous job, I've seen certain organizations where in knock and SOC is just like one group. You just have like basically uh, out of, let's just say 10 people, uh, two people will take care of vulnerability management and security event monitoring. There are other organizations where in it's, uh, they're bigger and they have a separate knock and they have a uh, separate SOC. Now, the NOC, sometimes you'll hear words like uh, security engineering. So it used to be network engineering, then it became like security engineering. Okay, so there's all those terminology. Now, so what is basically the essence of a security operation center? So the SOC is focused on uh, collecting uh, data and analyzing this data in order to find if there's you know any suspicious activities and then do the investigation and then if there are malicious activities respond to that basically think of the SOC as the group that uh, is involved in protecting the organization's infrastructure and information assets. So if you're going to think of it in terms of the different cybersecurity colors, this will be classified as a blue team type of activity. So it's more on the defense. So you may have heard, uh, you may have heard of like red team. So red team, these are like people doing uh, pen testing. These are people who are doing, um, think of it like adversarial, you know, simulation. Okay. Now, when we talk about the SOC, ideally, you have the SOC within the organization. It's embedded in the organization. Sometimes, uh, certain uh, companies may not have the maturity to have an in-house security operation center, and that's why they will engage the services of what is called the MSSP or a managed security services provider. So for this particular model, okay, that means there's an organization, think of them, they're like have uh, the one uh, pr providing the SOC capabilities to different clients. So in my case, I work for a company that provides managed security services. So we're basically the SOC of our clients. So in fact, when we uh, call them or, you know, send them like tickets, they, they refer to us as their SOC, okay? Now, there are pros and cons, like depending on, you know, the company, like whether they're going to build up their own SOC or, you know, um, engage the services of MSSP. Now, if uh, uh, since I'm talking to you who are like, you know, currently like students, so I'm talking from the perspective of someone who may be wondering, should I go for MSSP versus like an in-house SOC and all those things. So uh, for me personally, I chose like to work for an MSSP because I like variety so that uh, I, I get exposed to different kinds of industries. Like for example, I handle uh, clients in the manufacturing, you know, uh, sector. We have one like healthcare. We have like a telco. So each client has their own specific environment. Their specific, you know, um, challenges. Their specific technology that they're using. So for me, I'm able to actually, you know, understand all these different, you know, uh, industries based on the client needs. Now, um, you may also consider going for a co company wherein they have an in-house SOC. The nice thing about being an in-house SOC is that since you are just dealing, uh, you know, in that one corporate environment, 
uh, in a way, it's easier to understand what are the challenges. And in terms of communication, for example, you see something, you know, in your network monitoring tool, oh, this is the, it's something crossed the wire. You got the pickup, packet capture file, and then you look at it and then, oh, why is this person <laughs> downloading and installing this particular, you know, uh, software? Let's just say, and you, you have access to the Active Directory because you're an in-house SOC and you look at, you know, the person's role. Oh, this is uh, this person's, you know, in HR. Why are they downloading, uh, you know, let, let's just say uh, a hacking tool? <laughs> so. So if you're in that company, you know, uh, before COVID, you can just basically walk over and ask, hey, did you download it? <laughs> or you could like, you know, call them up and say like, hi, I'm, you know, I work for the SOC or I'm, you introduce yourself and then you tell them like, hey, I'm just like wondering, did you actually download this or you send them an email? Now, if you work for an MSSP, you don't have that direct access to the end users. So it has to go through like, you know, several layers. So there are like pros and cons, but, you know, basically it's you whether you want to go for a job that is like with an MSSP or uh, like a SOC job for a company with their in-house SOC. Okay. Okay. Now, so what are the uh, blue team skills uh, that you need in order to you know thrive in a SOC environment? So you have to have the basic host server network knowledge. Now, depending on the soft, they're like different tools. So it could be like the tools that they use is predominantly, you know, endpoint focus kind of tools. Let's just say they use uh, Far IHX or CrowdStrike or Silence, all those things. So you need to be familiar with the endpoint, uh, you know, uh, think of it like what is normal in an endpoint when it's startup, what are the processes the processes that's going to run and then you have to be familiar with the parent child relationship like for example uh the svc host okay uh should uh, should have the uh services as the parent process not some you know dodgy process you know there or like a, an unusual process there so each um processes in the windows environment will have the correct parent child relationship now if for example sorry excuse me <coughs> Sorry about that, I'm back. So now, if for example, in your environment, you predominantly look at, you know, network traffic. So that means you have to be uh, familiar with, you know, pickups, packet captures, like the common, you know, network protocols. Okay? And then of course, second point here is that you should be comfortable doing log analysis, data analysis. So it's very important that if you're going to be investigating an incident, you pay attention to the timeline. So you have you have to build up like a time timeline. Like for example, there was an alert that showed up, let's just say at exactly 10 a.m. And then you want to figure out like what happened. You have to go back, let's just say five, 10 minutes before that. And then after the alarm, like what happened? So you have to sort of like have a time uh, timeline. Okay. And then a little bit about digital forensics because it may be that you will be called upon to, you know, do some digging. So you may need to, you know, do some digital forensic stuff. So it really depends on uh, the SOC mandate because it could be that the company you work for, you let's just say you got a job in an in-house SOC, so you're just basically doing monitoring. And if there's really something suspicious or dodgy that like it needs further investigation. It may be that the company has a retainer with an external or like a third party to fear digital forensic incident response group. And they will just, you know, basically capture all the data or like capture, let's just say a memory image or a disk image and then provide it to that third party. So it really depends. And then incident response to like, for example, it was declared that, okay, this suspicious event is now actually a security incident and then you start doing your uh, incident response and then uh, depending also on the capability of the stock it may be that you're required to do uh, so a little bit of reverse engineering of malware so or it could be that you basically hand off the malware sample to like let's just say an in uh, a third party uh, investigating 
confirm and hey we got this we saw there was an alarm and there's this uh you know executable or this particular pdf file that was opened we don't have this let's just say this skill set and then you provide it to that particular uh you know third party professional services organization or it could be that everything's done inside your uh in the in, in the uh what you call in-house talk okay now for an MSSP, because there's like a lot of different clients, uh, there's a lot of, uh, you know, projects that you could get into. Like, for example, uh, you start there as a SOC analyst and you said like, oh, okay, I want to specialize on the FEAR, Digital Forensics and Incident Response. So uh, projects relating to that will be assigned to you. Or it could be that I want to focus on reverse engineering malware. So you could like, you know, do those um, reverse engineering projects. Okay, so it, it so uh, there's like you know pros and cons depending on whether you work for an in-house SOC or you actually work for an MSSP. Okay. Now, uh, so I mentioned that like my background was that I started first doing NOC-related kind of uh, work. So that was uh, with Cisco TAC Technical Assistance Center. Then I move into technical training and consultancy. So I used to work for a Cisco partner. Then after that, I got to work for uh, FARI. Been there like for seven years. So it was in FARI where in I really focused specifically on the fear, digital forensic incident response. Okay. And so it's coming from a very blue team kind of uh, perspective. Okay. So basically, when I say blue team, it's more of on the defense so we have to make sure that we have a good you know network infrastructure design we have you know we follow best practices we have uh you know security uh in terms of like layers we have all those like uh layers there now uh, and then when it comes to investigation so it's basically following the evidence so there is the think of it is like a scientific method like you have an you have a hypothesis so based on an alarm or an alert you have a hypothesis like okay let's just say you saw an alarm regarding an email okay that went through your system and one of your tools detected that there is something suspicious there so now what is your hypothesis your hypothesis is that okay this email was delivered to the user and the user opened that so with that hypothesis you start investigating looking at uh, whatever tools you have at your disposal and then investigating that and then as you gather the evidence you build up the timeline or like just simple like okay this email was you know delivered this time let's see whether it was opened and then after that is there something you know suspicious in the endpoint okay like for, for for example a pdf was opened and suddenly there was like a connection initiated by acrobat reader to a particular ip address and you you know it's a uh, command and control server and you actually check the reputation of that uh IP address and you figure out oh it's actually been used by other threat actors so so you sort of like build build up like that kind of you know mindset you're investigating you're investigating now uh how did my teammates for pen testers that influence me so number one they're very good in using hacker tools and they've actually repurposed the use of hacker tools for you know blue team perspective let's just say like i'm not sure if you're familiar with bloodhound but it's an open source tool wherein it's used predominantly by pen tester to figure out like active directory relationship like if there's particular end user is this like an end user with domain privileges like admin privileges or how uh how uh which one uh should i uh attack first as a you know pen tester if i'm like pen testing like thinking from a mindset of an attacker so that i could eventually get access to some of the servers so that's the blood bloodhound tool so we repurpose bloodhound as a collecting tool for active directory related artifacts and that's useful because uh for some of our clients i don't have direct access to query their active directory so if i see something there's an alert on our network monitoring tool that there was this user who you know connected to this site and i wanted to find out what's you know why are they doing that so i need to find out like what is their 
um, you know, uh, job title, job role. Okay, and there and in a way, using OSINT, open source Intel, sometimes I'm able to find out information about these people by just going through their social media profile. But sometimes they don't have any presence. And you're like, who is this person? Why are they using this or doing this? So there's those certain tools that uh, I can use. Okay. And then when I'm analyzing the logs, I'm instead of just like, okay, show me your stories. I'm now thinking from a perspective of if I'm if I'm an attacker, okay, how will I attack this particular organization? What will I go after? So uh, that kind of mindset now helps me like when I'm looking at logs. And in fact, there is a good link. I'm gonna provide it later on at the uh, one of the I mean the last slides. There's the Japan cert. They have a good tool analysis worksheet wherein they've actually analyzed different attacker tools and then if that particular tool was used in your organization what other logs or sources of evidence that you can check to find out whether that tool was used so that's a very good you know tool analysis worksheet okay and then third one of the things that we make full use of the vulnerability management tools so we also uh, we are a tenable partner and when I look at you know certain activities on the network that's affecting, let's just say the servers, I also check the servers. It may be that, hey, okay, this particular server like has all this like connection. Why is it like you know RDPs? Oh, you'll be surprised. Sometimes you can RDP directly into the server from outside the country. So I'm, I'm based in Australia, so the client is New Zealand. So I'm just gonna like check, oh my gosh, why is this like open? So I'm gonna check for that particular server, if there's like any reports in Tenable about that, and then I'm gonna bring that up and say like, hey, look, this is running this particular version or this particular ports are open. Uh, that's, that's part of like the weekly ticket that I send to them. Okay, now, <clears throat> sorry, uh, fourth part, demonstrate impact. Okay, so before you do this, okay, make sure that the client contract involves simulated adversarial activities. What do I mean? So I mentioned earlier that sometimes I'll check like, okay, is can I RDP directly into that server? So I can do that because that is part of the contract, okay? It's part of the contract that I could sort of like simulate someone who's out there in the internet trying to access you know their servers but if it's not part of the contract don't do that <laughs> because because you're basically like they, uh they will they will have like logs and if they have like another team internal team looking at logs why is there this ip address from australia <laughs> accessing our server so make sure that it's part of your contract so there's always that uh you know demonstrating impact so it used to be before when I just look at logs, I'll just say like, oh, I saw this. This is what I saw in the logs. But with this particular team, because they, they come from, um, you know, the red team kind of perspective, they always say like, we have to demonstrate impact. It's not enough that let's just say the, vulner the vulnerability management tool showed that there's this uh, ports open. Let's try to figure out whether we could get in. And even to the point of like guessing, you know, uh, using, you know, some common, uh, username, password, like let's just say admin, password123, and all those things. But once again, before you do that, <laughs> make sure that it's in the contract, okay? And then being playful, how can we get in? So we think about like, okay, if we're like monitoring this particular customer, let's see, let's see like based on their network traffic, their like guest Wi-Fi, let's, uh, let's figure out whether, you know, we can, can we actually get in like using guest Wi-Fi? Because they're, I have teammates, they're local in Auckland, they're in New Zealand. Sometimes they just like walk around, yeah, that's why guest Wi-Fi is open. Okay, and then we, we're gonna like, do, like, like you know, it's like, think of it like going the extra mile, but make sure that everything is within the contract, you know, you don't wanna do something that's not part of like, you know, contract, okay? So that's how my teammates have influ influenced me in a way that I used to think like, you know, purely like, okay, follow the evidence, follow the trail, you know, very blue team kind of thing. But now with them, they've influenced me. So now I always talk about like purple thinking, like a purple thing. So whatever we've learned from the red team, 
try to demonstrate the impact, use the different tools that we could uh, leverage from the red team in, in terms of you know securing um, the clients or the network, you know, and the infrastructure of our different clients. Now, one of the things that I love about tech, so I, I've been in tech for, uh, wow, 17 years now. Um, I, uh, specifically in cybersecurity starting 2013, so it's about seven years now. So one of the things that really uh, struck me in terms of like sticking to this field is this particular uh, ethos. It's like creed, hacker ethos. So, so basically, if you haven't heard of ha hacker ethos, so there's like three, you know, basic tenets to this. Uh, first is there's no judgment about your race, your sex, gender, academic background, or position. And there's a commitment to transparency and openness, wherein information is shared to everyone, especially if it's something that will he help the entire community. And third is sharing of one's talents and skills set to the community. So the thing here is that it doesn't matter where you come from, what's your linguistic, cultural background, ethnic background, all those things. The important thing is that you try to make sure that you learn and then whatever you've learned, you improve your skill set, you try to use that for the good of everyone. So uh, first, when I talk about hacker ethos in another group, it's a, a non-tech group. When they first heard the word hacker ethos, they thought, oh my God, they're hacking us. And then I clarified what was the original meaning of hacker before, you know, before mass media actually said that that's like a negative thing. So back in the late 90s, uh, there was cracker and hacker. So uh, crackers are the one who's like cracking password, doing those illegal stuff. When you say you're a hacker, you're trying to hack, understand uh, how this thing work or how this tech work, or you know, you're modifying it so that it will uh, do uh, what you want it to do. So that's basically the main, you know, idea about hacking. But you know, <laughs> media started using hackers. So that's why you now have uh, white hat hacker, black hat hacker, and then you also have like gray hat <laughs> hackers or all, all those things. But the most important thing is just this. Okay, so, and that's why I like sharing, you know, the knowledge that I have, and I'm very lucky that in this job, uh, in this company that I work for, I signed up with them because I made sure that before I signed the contract, there was a clause there that said that anything I work on be uh, belongs to them, and I don't like that because in my previous job, I was hindered from contributing to the community because there was a clause that anything I say, anything I do, even if during my free time, it belongs to the company. So now when I had a chance to find, like, you know, to get, uh, go for a new job, I made sure that in that contract, I modified it. I wrote there that um, this, uh, that anything I produce during work hours belong to the company, belongs to the company. But anything that's like, you know, during my free time, during my, you know, my weekends or like evenings, anything I do, I'd like to contribute back. And that's how I met Ray. We, we volunteer in another, you know, group online. So I met her, you know, online. Yeah. Okay. Now, so I talk about like Bloodhound. So there's a link here. And I've also talked about the Japan CERT uh, tools analysis worksheet. So I would like you, you know, uh, hopefully you go check that, put that in your bookmarks so that if you, you know, ever want to work in a stock, you have that particular worksheet available there. Okay. Now, do you have any questions? Okay, let me just look at the chat window. Okay, what are some professional organizations that are good for prospective and active SOC workers to be involved in? Okay. Um, one thing is like the OWAS. So uh, OWAS has different like chapters because they would, they will be talking about, you know, any issues seen regarding, you know, uh, software. So you're like, you know, aware of what's happening. And then, uh, depending on your industry, you have like what they call the ISAC, ISAW. So these are um, intelligent, these are, think of it, it's like sharing groups. Okay, so you have to figure out like which particular industry you're in. Okay, and then 
Of course, if you want to do OSINT, there's always trace labs, okay? You know, you could, uh, aside from doing OSINT, you're actually, you know, helping find, uh, you know, missing people, okay? So that will basically help you, you know, with your, uh, improve your OSINT skills. And then, uh, what else? A lot of the times, like, I'm, uh, I hang out in a lot of Slack and then in, even Discord channel. So there is a Discord channel for the FEAR, uh, Digital Forensics and Incident Response. Another is there's a mailing list from SANS, SANS Institute. So you can join their uh, mailing list and you get to like, you know, uh, see people asking questions and then you can like ask questions. So there's a uh, mailing list. Okay. I will not say ISACA or ISC squared because ISC squared is for the CISSP. It's a very broad, you know, I have, uh, for the record, I have CISSP and CISA. So it's a very broad kind of group. And sometimes the, the meetups, the topics there are not aligned with, you know, the SOC side. So, so anyway, going back to your question. So there's OAS, your OAS chapter, then you could uh, join the SANS DEFEAR uh, mailing list. Okay, and then what else? Yeah, uh, yeah. And for OSINT, there's uh, Trace Labs. Okay. And then depending on your area code, I think there's like local DEF CON groups, but, uh, but you have to choose like what the, uh, like, which meetups you join because sometimes it could be meetups on let's just say uh, hacking you know modems and all those things but that's not related to SOC so you just like find out and fortunately uh, for uh, one of the okay I'd like uh, I'd like to always think of things in a positive light so with the pandemic there's been a lot of organization that suddenly just started offering free content, free training, free, you know, uh, virtual summit. So keep your eye out. There's a lot like in, in Twitter sharing those information. So yeah. Okay. So anything else? Okay. Yes, yes, the virtual cons. Yeah, it makes it easier to attend. Yeah. Oh, anyway, if you have any follow-up questions, uh, in Twitter, I'm more active in Twitter than in LinkedIn. So in LinkedIn, I only go there like like once or twice a week during weekends. But on Twitter, I try to check like at night, my my nighttime, your daytime. Okay, so my DMs are uh, open. Yeah, yes, Adam. I hope that it continues post pandemic the virtual cons. Yes, I've heard of like other cons saying that we will continue this even after the pandemic. We'll have virtual cons because with the virtual conferences, it gives everybody from anywhere in the world with internet access, you know, the ability to join the con. So it's sort of like it has democratized. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like you know, it's like think of it like the hacker ethos. It's like the information is open to everyone. Okay. Yeah, and then if if ever you know anyone here like listening, you know, you, uh, after the skies open up and we can freely travel, if you're thinking of going to Australia, uh, like you know, you, you need like travel tips and all those things. Yeah, yeah, just send me like a DM in Twitter. I'll tell you like, okay, avoid this because there's a lot of those dangerous creatures. Yeah, seriously, we have a lot of snakes here. Yeah, you gotta be careful when you're hiking. Avoid the wall of fire. <laughs> yeah 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 that's true yeah there's like yeah like people with like health issues can't attend like you know like the distance and all those things yeah okay so anyway so questions anything else yeah feel free to unmute yourself okay uh, let me all just right. go go back okay let me see whether I could. Okay, let me just so that I could. Let me just uh, copy the link so that I can put it in the chat window. Okay, so chat. Okay, so that you could. Okay, so that's the Bloodhound tool that I specifically. 
referred to earlier and then this is the link okay there we go okay so i'll just stop sharing the screen okay i just wanted to say that even if you don't plan to work in a sock it's good to understand it because i work in osint and i work closely with um on-site sock teams um pretty often so it's good to kind of know what they're looking for and what they're doing and you know how you need to talk to them i'd also like to give you like a heads up like a tip about you know getting your foot in the right. IT field. it's like this the sock i not it like in the cyber security field uh the best ways to actually go into a sock environment uh, a lot of people would always think of like, oh, I want to be a pen tester, you know, like a black, uh, the a white hat hacker. But in terms of the projects, there's like less projects in terms of uh, red teams and, you know, pen testing. But there will always be a need for people to be in the SOC, like in the defense side. Think of it from this perspective. There, um, the attackers only have to be right once, you know, to be able to like uh, hack in, get into your environment but the defenders have to make sure as much as possible if it's possible they have to be right 100 percent of the time so it's, it's it's like really tiring you know like it's sort of like every day same old same old and and that's one of the reasons why there's I, i'll be honest there's also like some you know uh burnout in terms of the sock so it really depends on the team or the environment that you um get into because there are some uh sock that were in you could see that why are they frequently hiring for you know like sock analysts like think of it like every six months or so look at that maybe uh they're not really addressing you know job burnout okay so you'd like to stay there and enjoy you know what you're doing instead of you know getting burned out yeah Awesome. So um, there aren't any more questions. Mm -hmm. Pause okay. for a minute. No. Nope. Okay. Well, thank you for talking with us tonight, Gail. Um, yeah. I assume your time zone is opposite of ours, so it's probably pretty early. Uh, it's it's ten forty two a.m. here. I'm oh, okay. on GMT plus ten. I think I'm fourteen hours ahead of you. <laughs> yeah. 14 hours ahead of you. Yep. Well, we appreciate it. Yeah, no worries. And just reach out. And thank you also for the opportunity to talk to your uh, club and for like recording this. Hopefully, you know, other people consider, you know, uh, you know, working in a sock. Uh, he, you know me, I am, I, uh, pardon the language, I don't do bullshit stuff. I tell you like, oh, these are the cons and these are, I, I mean, these are the pros and these are the cons, you know, yeah. Well, I think it'll be a good recording for people to watch. Yeah. Okay. Well, so, thank you, thank everybody, you. for coming out. Have a good yeah, night. Thank you, Adam. You too. Take care there, everyone. Stay safe. Okay. So I'm going to be now. Thank you.